I would like to introduce Tracy Collier with the Peach Town Partnership. So we're here to talk about the Peach Town Partnership's monitoring program and science and opportunities. Thanks a lot, and uh, I'm waiting to see how long. I think they're going to take their photos and leave because I wanted to build on what Paul said earlier today about for you Canadians. There is a website where you can go and vote, and I was going to offer to give you my credit card number if you wanted to do that, but I don't think it's appropriate with those folks in the back of the room. So, so uh, I think instead I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Ken Curran was, I'm currently the just new as a science director for the Future Sound Partnership, Ken Curran had that position before me for a couple of years, and he, uh, I asked him, did, I'm talking about the monitoring effort and the science panel effort, and this was a lot of work that he did, that's the way for me to fucking blame if you don't like what I'm going to say, but also to Ken, I said, so do you want to give this talk? And he's like, no, 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 you go ahead, you do it. And then about an hour ago, he says, boy, I hope you got their talk stuff, it's really important, so I'll do my best, we want to bring up the presentation. So the Future Sound Partnership um, is another in a series of evolutionary agent, evolution of agencies that are supposed to be charged, that are charged with recovering and protecting Puget Sound. In this case, we have the deadline of 2020, but again, we know the difference between political deadlines and real deadlines, and I think all of us scientifically know that we have got a long slog ahead of us to do this work and to keep trying to deal with some of the effects of the increase in human population coupled with on top of that climate change, which is coming and going to affect our ecosystem. Um, sort of some of the precepts that the partnership is operating under is that we will use science-based approaches, uh, best available science. Every estuary restoration program in the U.S. and probably the world does the same thing. We will use the best available science. We all spend a lot of time trying to define what we mean. But basically, it means we have groups like this that are tackling scientific issues and trying to come up with reasonable approaches for either conducting the research or applying the knowledge we have to management in a way that lets us better uh, manage recovery of the ecosystem. Um, we have had a, a real strong emphasis on developing indicators of the ecosystem status as well as other parts of the recovery process and setting targets to measure progress. This, in my experience, I'm working on other estuary restoration programs as well. Um, that's not applied regularly across a lot of different programs, and the partnership and teaching science is a big deal. But mostly what I wanted to talk to you about today was this, this issue of a, a coordinated regional ecosystem monitoring program, because I think you're seeing that a lot of that is what we need for the Savish Sea in general. So Jacques asked me to talk a little bit about what this approach is in Puget Sound. And now, watching, having watched Sandy and her clicker, I'm going to try to do this the right way consistently. <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm a mimic, so I'll probably start going back, back and forth. So PSAMP, Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Program, before this we had PSAMP, which was the Puget Sound Ambient Monitoring Program, which evolved into PSAMP because it was the Puget Sound Assessment and Monitoring Program. But now it's P step, the P Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Program. We're trying to maintain so you know what we're talking about when we name our monitoring program. But basically, P Stamp was set up to be a um, basically looking at the status and trends, and it was pretty focused and limited, and it had difficulty mainly because of lack of resources in tying into management actions and this whole adaptive management that we all are trying to figure out how to actually implement in these programs. PSEMP, in contrast, is, is, is larger. In theory, will be better funded. Um, that hasn't really happened yet, but there is a lot of work going into the organization of PSEMP and trying to figure out how to build this regional ecosystem monitoring program. And it's a little clunky, in my view. It's got a steering committee with 23 members. They're representing federal and state agencies, tribes, local governments, NGOs, business, academia, and watershed organizations. Um, it's pretty hard to get anything done with a steering committee of 23 people. Nonetheless, people have been, in my view, putting in yeoman efforts to make this happen. They are developing, I think, a very robust framework for setting up a monitoring program for this regional approach in Puget Sound. Um, they've got nine technical work groups, which when you start adding the right people you need for these technical work groups, you now have a lot more agencies and a lot more organizations. Um, 
Brian yesterday talked about, he, he made the, the comment that uh, as far as sand lamps, that we're uh, way ahead of the game in Puget Sound. The forage, fish, and food web work group, however, is still forming. If you go to the website, you will see there's no content there yet. So while we may be ahead of the game, we're, we're ahead, but we're not probably as far as we should be because we don't have that group set up yet. Um, but there, there are varieties here. Obviously, the Salmata work group is the one that is probably of not the only, but a lot of the interest of, of this effort in terms of marine salmon survival. Um, and this has the option, as people develop monitoring programs, we can add work groups, we can merge work groups, whatever we need to do. Um, it, it has that flexibility built into the, the way PSEP is going to be organized. They're doing certain things. They just put out about uh, two months ago, they put out a 2011 overview of the state of the state of Puget Sound Marine Waters. Um, it covers many of the things that, again, people are talking about here that we need to get a better handle on as far as uh, issues of marine salmon survival in the Salish Sea. So that's things like the climate and weather certainly is a big deal, ocean conditions, um, the salinity, nutrients, dissolved oxygen, harmful algal blooms, contaminants, biotoxins, all these things we've talked about. This is actually a nice report that summarizes for 2011 what the combined body of technical folks know or at least think they know about the system. And we, we won't talk about the unknown knowns or the known unknowns or whichever one it was I was supposed to put up Rumsfeld for. Another thing we're doing is probably the first and major task of PSEP uh, is to assess what we're doing now. You, you hear that every time whenever there's people who want to set up a monitoring program, people come back, especially from the management arena, and they say, well, what are you already doing? We're spending a ton of money on monitoring. Why do we need more? Why do we need different? Why do we need a different approach? So they're going through, again, this is a, a pretty obligatory step in setting up a, a new con or a new framework for monitoring is to assess what you're doing now, um, where are the gaps, how much is it going to cost, etc. So in this, this report just came out was in, in October. Um, this is looking at the VST monitoring of ESA listed uh, salmon and steelhead in Puget Sound, and they've identified critical gaps. Um, it's a really nice report, but I want to show it here. God, Tammy, I almost did the same thing but I taught myself just in time. Um, so this shows a scoring of by watersheds, what's the monitoring effort, effort for Chinook in the blue and Steelhead in the red. There's a, a whole scoring system that's set up in the report that says this is how we have come up with these scores. You can go from 0 to 120. The, and again, the, the assessment was if you're between 70 and 120, you're doing well, you have good monitoring coverage. If you're between 50 and 70, you're, you're moderate, and if you're below 50, you're considered to be inadequate in the monitoring that at this time, based on what we know, this is the monitoring we think we need to understand what's happening with these different populations in these different, different regions. And as you can see, this is a quote from the report, steelhead population monitoring is dramatically deficient compared to Chinook. Again, what you're hearing here at this workshop is we're talking about marine survival. There's probably a lot of things we, well, that's what we're going to be talking about tomorrow. What do we need to add to the research and to the monitoring effort to better understand this marine survival component? But just then, they've identified what it would take in terms of cost in today's dollars to get the monitoring for steelhead up to adequate or good levels um, for those populations in Puget Sound. And then the, the whole, we've got the vital signs. We've got the dashboard of indicators. Um, how are we doing on Puget Sound? We've just recently gotten quite a bit of, um, I'll say, constructive criticism on this issue of our indicators. Um, but this is a big part. PSEMP is eventually going to be, the, right now, for the state of the sound that just came out, um, they're responsible for the assessment of the state of the ecosystem, uh, putting that content into the state of the sound report. And you saw that uh, graph on the lower right just yesterday on the spawning biomass of herring stocks in Puget Sound, showing that not all of them are doing as well as they should. Um, so the state of the sound report went to the governor, uh, so it was election day, so five days ago it went to the governor uh, on time, which was a 
great accomplishment. Um, I, again, I've been outside the Puget Sound arena for a few years, and I know it's been a big issue for getting things done in a timely way, but the partnership did deliver this on time to the governor. And one of the things that you share in your desktop, and it says Chinook Salmon over the very top, um, it basically said that we have made no progress in our goals of trying to restore Chinook Salmon populations in Puget Sound by 2020. Um, this says, is there progress? No, we were still at the baseline. We've, one population has gone up, discernibly one's gone down, the rest we can't discern trends. I, I disagreed with this. It says, is the target met? No. Well, the target's not for another eight years. Every one of our indicators, we say the target's not met. To me, that's like a waste of ink and paper. But, you know, <laughs> but I, but Ken was in charge at the time, so. <laughs> Actually, I was at that meeting, I think, when they made that decision, so it's my fault. <laughs> so the, the thing that I think is critical for these regional monitoring programs is that we can put a stamp of approval on those sorts of results. When we talk about trends, and again, there's a tremendous amount of complexity underneath that simple target bar that we call it, um, but if, if we can't say that this monitoring was done and reported objectively, without bias, and without influence from a state agency, from whoever is for the work, then we have problems. In my view, that's one of the more critical things we've got to do. Um, I think that PSAMP is viewed right now as being that objective, non-biased body, but it's going to be tough, in my view, to maintain that into the future, and, and I think that's one of the main things the partnership's got to work on, is to maintain that independence of the monitoring effort, because otherwise, you just lose credibility so quickly. So they're going to, PSEP is going to continue tracking these vital sign indicators. Um, we've got to, we've got to uh, improve data transparency. Um, we've got to refine and recommend additional ecosystem indicators. Again, uh, we did not do a thorough job in selecting indicators for all aspects of the ecosystem status. We've got to go back and redo that, and that'll be happening in the next year. In the, in the context of this workshop, a, a research plan that is addressing marine survival of Salmon is um, obviously, and this is what's going to happen, as Jock was just saying, in, into the spring of 2013, this is going to help us identify these key monitoring parameters and gaps for this particular aspect of salmon conservation. Um, in our view, it's going to really help drive this cross-work group integration. You've heard here, it's not just the salmon biologists that need to figure this out. We've got to have the people that are dealing with conditions of marine waters, including the harmful algal blooms, nutrients. This issue of the food webs, forage fish is a big deal, and as we just heard today, toxics. We've, we've got work groups in all of these areas. If we're going to have a marine survival approach, it's got to roll all that into it. And then, again, this, this a research plan really will help refine and develop these indicators and indices, and that's what's going to happen here to an extent on Thursday and Friday. But then there's a science panel on top of that, and I'm still trying to figure out there's the Puget Partnership Science Program, which is my folks, there's the science panel, and there's the Puget Sound Institute, and I'm trying to figure out how they're all different, and Ken didn't give me an easy worksheet on that, so I'm still working it out. But the, the science panel, in conjunction with the Partnership Science staff, has put together what we call a biennial science work plan for 2011 to 2013, and Jacques was saying, how do we tie into that? And I think it's really pretty straightforward. They've got 47 things that they think are high priority science needs for Puget Sound conservation and recovery, and one of those is identify the causes of the apparent decline in marine survival of salmon as they leave their natal rivers and exit Puget Sound. So to me, there's no inconsistency. This is one of the high priority science needs so to the extent that there's a research plan that gets developed here that is broader than, than Puget Sound and, and, and is the Salish Sea in general, um, my sense is the science panel, the science program, the partnership is going to embrace that, and the question is how do we then resource that to get that work done. Um, I don't think though there's any disconnect. And then Finally, the, the issue is they have a number of other science work plans that address pathogens, that address toxics, that address stressors on forage fish. Um, these things all are integral to the science plan that is being developed by the partnership. So again, it's a matter of 
going through what's there, cross-locking, et cetera, all these things we do um, to make sure that we are using our resources and looking for funding to do the things that we think are the most important. So a couple of last things I wanted to mention. One is the Encyclopedia of Puget Sound. That's an effort that's coming out of the Puget Sound Institute, which is the University of Washington uh, initiative. And they are trying to put together what they call peer-reviewed scientific synthesis articles that represent the state of scientific knowledge about Puget Sound. Joel Baker uh, is the head of the PSI. He's been getting a lot of questions lately about what are you going to do about the Salish Sea? Can you change the name to the Salish Encyclopedia of the Salish Sea? Um, he's resisting, but I think eventually my prediction is I'll bet he'll come around. Um, for right now, he says absolutely not. But he will, <laughs> they will accept information into the encyclopedia. They will accept synthetic articles. And they just had their first meeting of their editorial board a couple of weeks ago. And I was there. And I think that my sense is they're still not sure if they're going to be this science repository for scientists to go through or to go to, or are they going to be a, a place where the public can go, like the Encyclopedia of Life, the Encyclopedia of, of Earth. Is there going to be that kind of place where you go to to find out what the scientists think in a way that the average educated layperson can understand? So I think they've still got to sort that out. If you have thoughts on that, go to the website, look at it, tell them what you think. And then finally, uh, just two months ago, a month and a half ago, there was a meeting up here in Bellingham, a symposium on cross-border marine science and policy uh, at, at Western. Um, I just wanted to point out that that happened. I think it did not have, uh, well, Zach knows, because it's a, you were asking about having a major part of that be this issue of the sound and the marine survival. Um, the meeting was already set, but this was sponsored by the science panel of the partnership. Um, Ian's here, he can, he can talk about some of the, the outcomes of this, but my sense the outcomes of this were uh, one, that we needed to really strengthen and, and somehow institutionally support the Save HC conference, um, that that was a really big deal. Um, there was a, a need to have a strategic plan for uh, solidifying the work, cross border work between Canada and the U.S. on the Save HC. For some reason, Ian, where are you sitting right now? You can tell me. We call that the Marshall Plan, which is about the reconstruction of war torn Europe. And I'm not sure why that's applicable here, but anyway, that was, that was, what? Oh, that's right. Yeah, it was the Fraser Basin Council and David Marshall. That's right. That was the reason. That was the reason. <laughs> so good, because I wasn't going, oh, why do we call it the Marshall Plan? Thank you very much for that. And then finally, um, the Orange Book that was written in 1994, Dick Beamish was one of the editors of that, um, that was, as far as I can tell, the last time that we looked, tried to look across these science issues in both the Strait of Georgia, uh, Juan de Fuca, and the Puget Sound, the State of Sea, and there's a real need to update that, and there's a commitment to try to have that done before the next State of Sea conference. So I think that's enough. Um, agency policy stuff, so if there's any questions, quick ones, I'll take them, but I think I'm out of time, so thanks a lot for your time. Thanks, Tracy. I think what I'd like to suggest is that if people have questions for Tracy, you can drop them down, and we'll combine questions for Tracy's talk with the question and answer session that will follow Bill's intent. So, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Bill Peterson with Noah Fisher, who will talk about lessons learned from the Columbia Library Corporation study. And then following him, I finally will also from Noah Fisher, who will talk about uh, lessons learned from the very Institute. Okay, thanks. Um, so, I'm an oceanographer and a zooplankton guy. I'm going to use some zooplankton uh, words at this meeting. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about a program that we are just finishing up phase one. Uh, we're right now in the, in the synthesis phase of a program funded by the Bonneville Power Administration. We spent about $35 million in 15 years, maybe $30 million, something like that, and uh, it's a lot of money. And uh, we did pretty well, I think. But in any case, I'm going to try to summarize some of our work, but not a lot of science. It's mostly what we learned that we did right and what we learned that we did wrong and what we learned that we didn't didn't learn to use Ian's kind of a way of 
same thing. <laughs> and like and like Ian's metaphor I love this morning about tipping the flat rock across the calm pond. I'm just gonna do a few little things that was a lovely metaphor. And I wrote that one down for future use. <laughs> Is that your own or just here's that that's a good one. Okay, so um all right, so here we go. Let's uh Tracy is a, was the first one in to get every slide perfect, wasn't it? Pretty close. So that's my goal. <laughs> yeah, I think so. So, anyhow, uh, this, I'm speaking in, on behalf of a group of about 30 people. Mostly work for uh, Noah Fisheries and for Oregon State University. We have a couple of people from the uh, UW involved and from the Oregon Graduate Institute in uh, Beaverton. So we're trying to put together um, understanding of ocean phase of, of salmon to develop outlooks and management advice uh, to managers based on a bunch of indicators we've developed. And the indicators are I'll uh, talk about on Thursday, actually, but not so much today. But in case, um, so the old red circle is the part of the world we've been thinking about. And uh, so this slide outlines the, the approach we've taken to this last 15 years of uh, uh, work. So, as you know, the MPGO and the PDO are two large-scale factors that can affect the coastal waters off South Oregon and Western British Columbia. You know all about those two things. Uh, Richard told you about the tilt, and I'll tell you a little more about the tilt in a couple of slides from now. Get that little bit better clarified. Uh, and so events have a big impact on us. So, what I'm reminding people of this part of the slide is that you have to keep in mind events they're happening thousands of miles away from here to understand what's happening to salmon off the coast. You can't just put your blinders on and say, well, it's all about disease it's right here. Now it's about things like the equator, things across the whole net It's very important to, to do this helicopter thing, which I love as well. Um, there, there, there's local conditions that affect salmon when they go to sea and then during their, their time at sea upwelling. It's called the spring transition. That's when upwelling actually begins and then the coastal currents. And of course, there's the biology, and um, there's a little salmon right there, and he's part of the food chain, so he's affected by bottom-up processes, phytoplankton, zooplankton, forage fish, and the predators. We've done work on all four of those trophic levels, and of course, the salmon has to deal with top-down processes. So, it's pretty simple, right? He goes to see, he has two things in mind, find something to eat and not get eaten. That, that is not a stressful life, I don't think. Or maybe it is, but it seems simple enough. And so I think our example, uh, our work is an example of, of one of the ways to look at the ecosystem and develop management advice based on ecosystem measurements. All right. So all the work that we've done is uh, based on sampling in uh, May and June and September since 1998. We've got 15 years of data now. We've sampled all these uh, these transects from the push down to uh, Newport, and this is of course Washington, Oregon. And then uh, we also have a, a sampling program off Newport, which I run, and that's been going on, on for 17 years. That's bi-weekly sampling. That's every two weeks of, uh, of the physics of the water, the nutrients, chlorophyll, zooplankton uh, species, ichthyoplankton, and uh, krill. We have historical data as well from the 60s. And zooplankton from these years here, and the juvenile salmon data, which I'll mention briefly a little bit later on, from work by uh, Bill Percy. So why bother with any of this stuff? Well, one of the reasons that we think it's important to do the ocean work is that it helps to interpret what's happening in fresh water. If a lot of fish come back one year to a, uh, to a watershed, is it because you fix the watershed or because the ocean is favorable? You have to know both things, what's happening in the ocean and what's happening in your watershed critical is to keep that in mind. Uh, uh, this is a big issue with the Bonneville Power Cable, the early warning indicators. And we're up to the point now where we can, I, I think we can give an advice on what the future ocean is actually looking like. And so maybe next year, the El Nino forecast, for example, uh, we're learning about El Nino's more and more, the next year's one could be a really a hard one. And we can tell them that now, even before the El Nino has arrived. The PDO changes sign quite often, as does the NPGO. What happens when that thing, those things change sign? Up well, as you learn from some people today, it's, it's been coming later and later. Um, other years, it's been delayed for three or four months, as in the year 2005, as a disaster year for salmon. 
because we had no luck on me until the middle of July. It was extremely unusual. And it caused the shutdown of the folks of the Chinook fishery off the coast of Oregon and California for two years. $100 million impact because of this 2005 didn't help well for like three months, three months later. A simple little thing, $100 million impact. Pretty neat. And then I'm looking at stratification of the water column as we are in the state of sea and uh, first water input. Another thing is uh, we've been thinking about this. This is largely based on work that, uh, uh, that Lori's doing in Thunder River Estuary. And that is, can we help the hatchery people tell them when to release these fish rather than wait and rather than doing them all in one pot like we discussed this morning? Maybe you can spread them out over a couple, couple three weeks. And we could maybe say that, in, like right now, the ocean is great. So let them go today if you can, because if you hit them right now, they'll be, they'll, they'll be well. That's, these are kind of thought exercises right now. But I think you're from hope with this. I really do. Um, but then, don't you rather have a view? I mean, you can get a Model T Ford, you can like blacks, and you'll be really, really happy. But the Buick has all the bells and whistles in it. I mean, that's what you have to actually get. But I like this Buick one. Um, so if you really want to work out ocean conditions, you can't just look at the PDO or look it up on your well, it's all I need to know is PDO, and I'm done with it. You've got to have all the steps in the process, and that's what we've all been saying in the last, the last two days. You've got to look at the ecosystem, look at the physics, the PDO, NPGO, MSO, upwelling, stratification, the wind, you name it. You've got to look at it all, and that's ecosystem approach, obviously. Um, then try some forecasting. Give it a whirl. It's kind of fun. <laughs> okay, so here's my outline of, of lessons learned, uh, where time to live, uh, some GSI stuff, comments on growth, on habitat characterization, some trophic ecology, governance, and database stuff. Um, and I tried to fix things that I, I could see from the outline that weren't, hadn't been talked about much, uh, less than a So these are, there'll be some new things here. I hope. So where does Hammond live? Well, on the left, we have a two, we have four charts. Uh, the top labels June and September in Coho and Yearling Chinook. And on the right, I got some bullets to look at. So the first thing is the sub Yearling Chinooks that are known as, I believe, ocean type Chinooks. There's no map for them here, but they live really close to shore. When they go to the sea, the ocean, they, they live within about a mile or two of the beach. And in fact, if you're out in the surf, the fields are nibbling on your ankles. It could be a false chinook. I mean, they live right in the surf zone. Amazing little guys. And, but the Yerno chinooks are about halfway across the shelf, and the coho can be further offshore. So, here's this ocean that just, it looks to you like it's totally uniform. Just this blue water, whatever, green water. But these fish carve it up, and I mean, they see it very differently. And what the habitat differences are, I won't discuss today, but it's pretty clear that they want to live in places apart from each other. And you tell me why, and then we can get the Nobel Prize for salmon research. <laughs> there may be one, but they do know. Uh, they tend to like water that's at 13 degrees centigrade. When it's really cold, you don't find any salmon at all. They like to be fairly salty. They don't like high chlorophyll water. The interesting thing is the last, the last few bullets is that we do 50 trawls per cruise on average, and we catch half the fish in about three trawls. We catch no fish in about half the trolls. I mean, they're super catchy. And when you design your sampling plan, you've got to keep this in mind, that you've got to do a lot of stations, and you've got to get those zeros. Zeros are data, too. We often forget that. Okay? Um, and then the other thing that's interesting is the, uh, well, the variance to me, and I'll discuss in the next slide, but on average, we catch about one fish per kilometer. So these fish are kind of rare. And this trawl we use is similar to the one that uh, Rusty and, and uh, Mark use. It's a picture of a five-story building. This hotel's four stories. Half a football field wide and a football field long. That's the size of this trawl. So something that size is being towed for about four or five kilometers. And we'll catch sometimes four or five fish. That's rare, I think. But they're also super catchy. And that's the next slide here. Whoops. Did it. I'm <laughs> just <laughs> 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 surprised, man. <laughs> Okay, so on the left is the frequency distribution of our catches, uh, and the number per, per kilometer trawl below there. And, uh, zero is the most frequent, uh, number that we, that we have. Okay. 
but half the trials mean other types of trials fish. And that's for coho and chinook for the years indicated. Then down below is the variance of the mean ratio. This is a, this is a measure of, of the taxon. It averages about five, but it levels off at around ten. Now that's from this trawl that we told for about five kilometers. Now Bill Pearson sampled for five years with a, and a cursing off of Oregon and Washington. And, um, oh, there we go. And he, his rare size were up near 100. Now what that means is that the scale of a person is where you're finding the patches. So the scale of maybe half of this room is really where these patches are. So they're really in tight little bundles out there. And so when we do our trawling, we might pick up two or three these tight little patches. But what we don't know in these patches is if they're all from the same river, or the same hatchery, we don't know anything about that quite yet. It's interesting that they do seem to like, most of them like to be together. And when we catch these you know, singletons, I don't know whether those are six fish or what. We really don't know. But anyhow, they're out there. Um, but being that the data are not normally distributed, you've got to look. What have I done? Here we go. Um, you have to use these odd models that everybody hates. So this is progression, negative binomial, and what's called cosy gams. These are gams that can account for both the zeros as well as the non-zero data. They're interesting models to use. Maybe the paper just came out a few weeks ago about this. Okay, GSI work. Uh, David Thiel from our center in Seattle and others have come up with about six or so um, different stocks. And those are the names right there. And interestingly, uh, as Kurt mentioned this morning, we have um, these summer fall yearlings and summer fall sub yearlings. Which I don't fully understand, but these are fish that must be on the border of U.S. and Canada. They don't know what they're going to be. <laughs> so, but um, uh, my next examples are really where you find stocks of the Snake River Chinooks, these guys here. So the spring Chinook yearlings and fall Chinook sub yearlings. So when you go to the ocean, you think they would say, okay, what's well, the ocean? I'm just going to roam around here and see what's going on. But well, that's not the case. So the springs come out in, in spring, and in May they're found mostly Right, well, off of, off of the river, and then it's a few open roots here. By June, they're mostly gone. September, they're, they're all gone. The falls come out a bit later, obviously, and uh, in June. But in September, they're right up against the coast, like I mentioned to you earlier. So very different strategies for a fish of the same genus. I'm always amazed by this kind of stuff. Okay, growth. We did a lot of work with growth, and I think we all know that this is, this is the simple message here that you can't look at change in length of a cohort and then call those length differences growth. That really isn't fair. It's biased by uh, tradition. So you need to measure individual growth, and that's what we've done. And I'm only going to say that we've done this with uh, IGF, which uh, we talked about this morning, and with Otolis. Um, but work with individuals when you try out your growth studies. Don't look at the cohorts are a little less valuable for growth for growth studies. Habitat characterization, very important to do this, to make sure that uh, those who are doing the trawling also have oceanographers involved. To do CTDs at every station, very important. Measure chlorophyll through those little plankton toes. Get some index of the prey fields if you can. Uh, it's really tough. Now, this, this fourth point, we just couldn't get the prey field fully characterized in our work. It takes another ship, more people, a different kind of a troll. It's a real challenge to look at the prey field itself, to look at those little, these small fish, these little guys. You don't catch them in a bongo net, and they're too small to get caught by the big troll we use for the salmon. So you get, if you can look at prey field, which I think you should, because you can compare prey field then to what the salmon are eating. And we don't do that very well. It would be nice to be able to do that. And if you guys could pull that off, it would be a real coup, I think so. Uh, and then the top-down impacts, once again, uh, we have mixed results with that. You need another boat, again, to do the work, um, and in more people. And so uh, the hard part of the program like you're designing is how much money do you have and what can you really do right? If you spread it too thin, you'll get nothing done. I think we all know that. So you need to focus on some aspect, and you know, our focus basically was the, the bottom-up stuff. It's a little cheaper. Okay, that might make it. <laughs> Little plankton. Who couldn't love those beautiful things? I mean, come on. <laughs> so I work on little plankton, and uh, so one, one of the things we've learned from this 15 years of, of work is a pretty simple story. And that's that um, 
transport early explains a lot of the variability in the copepods that we find in the Northern California current. All right, so this coastal current brings the subarctic copepods down from the north. The west wind drift, which is here, brings animals in from offshore. And in the, in the US winter time, these currents reverse and bring animals up from the south. So the ecosystem structure at the volcanic level is dependent entirely upon the source waters that just feed the California current. And that's important for this one very simple reason, that these are warm water taxa that are coming up from the south or coming up, come in from offshore are very small, and they don't, they don't have much of, a, much, a much lipid content, where the cold water taxa are full of lipids, which makes the whole food chain much more bio, uh, bioenergetically enriched. So, this is what I like to remind people, that a fat salmon is a happy salmon. Okay, another simple message. But we have done very little lipid research. Uh, we began some work the last couple of years, but we really failed to do lipid work when at the beginning when we should have. It's easy to assume, well, they're copepods and the lipids are the same every year. We'll multiply some average value by the bonus. No, that doesn't work. And he asked Mark Trudell, he'll, he'll second that notion. So you need to get a lipid program going, I think, if you're going to do bottom-up work. I think it would be very, very useful. Uh, something else that we did, uh, which is pretty unique, is we looked at marine parasites as a way to determine the uh, what salmon are actually eating. Three. Okay. <laughs> and this is work that's been done by Tim Jacobson. It just fascinates the heck out of me. So these parasites, I don't give up. <laughs> okay, parasites are coming as eggs out of the species of a green animal. They're taken up by euphalogids or by different copepod species. They go into the food chain into these uh, forage fish, which are then eaten by the salmon and then eaten by the, the killer whales this, in this example right here. But by knowing the parasites that inhabit different species of euphalogids or the copepods, you can look at the parasites in the stomachs of these fish and know what they've been eating. And what's nice about it is you get an like, integrated view over the past few months, whereas you look at a fish's stomach, that's what they ate four hours ago. That's it. It's not what they ate last month. It's what they ate just, just to choose this the present meal. So this gives you uh, an integrated view of what the salmon have been eating. And it's amazing how it correlates with, with the copepods. It's kind of frightening, actually. But I think it's meaningful. I don't know. Okay, Pacific cakes are also predators on, on, on salmon. This is the work that was, that was done by Bob Emmett, uh, Bob Emmett, and he's found nice correlations with the abundances of hake uh, on the, uh, I give up, I'll, I'll just have to quit. <laughs> abundance of the hake versus the adult returns to a bottom dam of Falchinux and of Coho. So it seems like the, when the ocean's warm, there's more hake actually come up onto the shelf. And they're, they're up there in you know, May and June when salmon are going to sea, and they're hake are eating a lot of salmon. And when the ocean's cold, they'll take her out there in deep water. The salmon have a bit of a refuge, so. Uh, governance. And, yeah, I'm almost done. And you need a steering committee. You can't forget that. You gotta plan these cruises out. You gotta write the cruise reports. This is, we on this to be so important that when you get back from a cruise, write up a report, because you forget really quickly what you learned. And the reports have to be fairly comprehensive. Ours are like 50, 60 pages long, but they're extremely useful documents. You'll just love them. You need protocols for what gets done on your cruises. You'll be amazed how many times the cruise is ready to go, and someone says, oh, can you bring me back a few sand lamps or something? It's like, no. <laughs> Or yes, but you have, to, you have to have a way to, to sort out these kinds of requests, and they're going to come, I guarantee you. Uh, policies on data sharing. This is, this is really sticky, and uh, we need to talk about that. Some data are common to the whole group, others are highly proprietary, and you need to decide who's going to, who gets to share what with each other. Another important issue. And uh, how about publications? Who's going to offer these darn things? Uh, it will be disputes. Another simple thing, which is a nightmare, sample storage. Where are you going to put these fish you to collect? Minus 80 freezers? How many are you going to buy? Where are you going to put them? Who's going to pay for electricity? These are big deals, it turns out. You can have team meetings as often as you can. We do twice a year. And then finally, 
synthesis papers. Who's going to write these things? Somebody's got to write them. And uh, right now we're finding it hard to find the time, aren't we, Kurt? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a really big deal. And then finally database management, and that's my last one. Am I okay with time? Pretty much. Yeah. So database management is another issue that we did not wrestle with, but we began it on day one. Okay. There's a person in our group who works with me, Cheryl Morgan, who this is her passion, and she became the database manager. Uh, and, and yes, she's an active scientist as well as a database manager, and she's a database taskmaster. You can do nothing with the database without her permission. <laughs> and uh, so the first thing you should do is make sure you understand how, who will do the database, who's going to control it. You probably have two of them. I don't know how you're going to do all this, but it's a it's a huge it'll be a huge problem if you don't do something about it right away. Believe me. Error checking is a huge thing with Cheryl. Any paper data gets checked by two other people. Okay? Paper data is really hard to deal with. Because some people don't write as clearly as other people write, et cetera, et cetera. And then for CTD data, there's always spikes which have to be pulled out of the data. Same with chlorophyll data. Oh, uh, how do you, how do PIs on a project ask for data? What if uh, somebody wants all of my data, and I say, uh-uh, or, well, I don't know, maybe, you know, but it's, 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 it's another big issue that's come up is when you have these big, huge programs like this, how do you share the data? And then this is the one that's almost upon us right now. Somebody, someone someday is going to say, I want all your data, and they have, they have a right to it, it turns out. They do, depending on who's responding the work. So, like I say, these good Boy Scouts have been prepared for this day because it's going to come. And it's a tough one to decide. So, what data do you really have to give to people? Okay? Is it your, is it your hard earned data that you sweated over for like a month to get one data point? Yeah, for sure, yeah, you're not. Yeah, you do, actually. So. All right, that's it. And these are the people that paid, paid the bills over the years. Bonneville Power has paid like most of the money. But Globex has been a big contributor. No, of course, program called, called Cobex. NSF and NASA have all funded my Newport work. Um, you got to think about this too. About you won't get enough money from one place. I would guarantee it. You got to have extra money. And you got to be rent So um, I think that's it. You know, I'm almost on time. <laughs> So we're going to do um, a combined Q&A at the end. So we'll bring you back up. Good. All right. Talk about the Well, I heard the question in the room is, what is an Alaskan doing in a Salish team meeting? And I, when I first got my first email from Mike back in June, I said, well, what do you need an Alaskan here for? And he said, well, what I want to know is, can you give us some information on what works and what doesn't for ecosystem surveys? So I said, oh, all right, I'll try to help you guys for that. And then that's the title, Insights into Salmon Ocean Ecology for Near Shore Marine Surveys. I'm a, I'm the program manager for the Ecosystem Monitoring Assessment Program at the Oscar Laboratories. It's part of the Alaska Fishery Science Center. Let's see if I can work this. So. <laughs> So I'm going to get my uh, conclusion slide right up front. Uh, obviously, you're going through this process right now on, on what works, or uh, trying to define what, how to do a, a, uh, an ecosystem survey in the Salish Sea. Uh, when we were doing this, obviously, it's important to define the goals and the hypotheses on what you want to uh, accomplish. Uh, we found that it's been very important to be able to sample through populations in order to answer what's going on uh, with, with the population. We determined that systematic grids are some of the best ways to do it, at least in the ecosystems that we're surveying up in the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea. Uh, we also have some seasonal sampling along migration corridors uh, inside southeast uh, Alaska. Down, oops, okay, yeah, I see how that works. Down in this area right here, which is, uh, I'll show some information from that, which is actually helping management uh, for forecasting salmon. We, we have fisheries 
collections and also oceanographic collections on the on the ships that we're doing. We found that oceanography is extremely important to collect along with the fish information. And so we put a lot of effort to make sure that the ships that we're out doing the work on can actually take the collect oceanography while we're there. And also the biological information which um, includes the ocean, the biological oceanography which is zooplankton and the fish from and we I'll show you the type of net that we're using for that. A time frame is really going to be an important concept, and I'm going to give you an example of a time period that we were surveying in the Bering Sea, and if you just had a short time period, you would see that you may have different answers to the questions versus if you had a longer time period. And then I heard a lot of talk about modeling and monitoring, Well, we're discussing that right now. Obviously, you're looking right here at what we surveyed last year, or 2012, uh, these are systematic grids. We have ships that are working all the way up into the Chukchi Sea. This is 72 north. This is four ships. It takes a lot of money to do that, and so we're not going to be able to do this every year. And we're going to be working on creating models that connect climate to energy. I know energy is something people have been talking about in the fish that they're looking at. So we want to get climate to energy of the fish, and then when we get those models in place, we're going to hopefully be able to continue monitoring maybe on biannual or triannual basis. So uh, oceanography is really important and you can see these grids are actually spaced differently between the Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea all the way up into the Chukchi Sea and that's, these grids were developed based on the oceanographic characteristics of the ecosystems that we're in. Obviously the Gulf of Alaska is a downline system, you've got real narrow uh, shelf area right there. There's currents along that shelf, and we want to know what's going on at a more tighter scale. And so we have, like you can see over here, a much tighter grid spacing. Uh, we've worked our, with oceanographers over in the Bering Sea and all the way up in the Chukchi Sea. And in the time period that we're actually out doing the surveys, the uh, oceanography is a little better defined. There's not as much mesoscale variability going on in, in the Bering Sea. And we, look, we, we determined that this grid spacing um, in these regions of the Bering Sea works well to provide us with the information they need on the oceanography and the fish. Okay, so here's some examples. Uh, before I get to the examples, I'll talk about what we're doing out there. So we're using a surface trawl. Uh, it's actually a midwater trawl that we've rigged the fish at the surface. And uh, we've been using this trawl since 1995. And we determined that this was the best best method for sampling uh, fish in the surface waters based on a study that we did with our Canadian colleagues back in 95. And we also note that that's pretty much what a lot, a lot of the other uh, groups that are studying salmon in, in the uh, marine environment are using. In fact, we have our international colleagues in Russia and Japan use trials too to look at the salmon. Ours is uh, rigged to fish near the surface. We have we have floats on the head rope, and we know that it's floating at the surface. You can actually see those floats when, we're, when we have the net fishing. And it fishes at a depth of about 25 meters and 60 meters wide. So every one of those little dots on the map that you saw on the previous screen, we're putting this trawl out. And along with this trawl, we're looking at all the ecosystem indicators. So the physical oceanography, we have uh, we're using a NOAA ship, Oscar Dyson, so they're set up to do oceanography, but then we also have charter vessels. So we had to pay a lot of money to set those charter vessels up with oceanographic winches to be able to deploy these, this gear. And we have a, a CTD carousel here. We actually do have water bottles, so we're deploying this, getting vertical information on, on the oceanography, um, also collecting water samples to look at the chemistry and nutrients in the water. Uh, we have a bongo net that we're looking at uh, deploying every one of these stations to get zooplankton species, composition, and biomass. This is really important because we want to be able to use a lot of this data in some of the bioenergetic models that we, we are, are going to hopefully work on soon. And it, it allows us to look at the, uh, as, uh, as Bill pointed out last time, the type of zooplankton are out there. Are they going to be these high lipid content zooplankton species or, or more less lipid? And then we're using our uh, our nets to get distribution of the fish. Relative abundance is really important if you're trying to determine where mortality is going on, especially for 
salmon if you've got these critical periods, which are the first few weeks at sea versus over winter. We like to know, uh, you know, giving a relative abundance. Uh, can we look at the relative mortality that's going on at these various times? And we're looking at the fish diet because we want to know what they're eating. Are they eating healthy prey or fit prey? And then, of course, size and then energetics. And in 2008, we uh, included midwater acoustics. And we did that because, well, I work at the Alaska Fishery Science Center. We manage ground fish, or actually we do research on ground fish. And so along with our surface trawl where we're catching salmon and other species, we're also wanting to know what's going on below that 25 meters. And so since 2008, we've had uh, acoustic information and in doing midwater trawls on top of all this other stuff that we're doing. <clears throat> and this makes it really challenging. We have oceanographers, you have biologists, and then you have acousticians. And it's, it's uh, all being done on, on one boat. So here's some examples. Typically, we all get together to talk about what we're going to do in a crisis time. Well, uh, we started working in the Bering Sea at the Alaska Fishery Science Center after two years after this 97 salmon failure. And the Secretary of uh, the Department of Commerce, Secretary Daly, and I work in the Department of Commerce, pretty much said that uh, we need to improve our knowledge of how climatic changes impact the health of our coastal resources based on this failure to, to Western Alaska. So he says connect climate to resource. So our goal is to determine how the impact of climate variability and change on early marine ecology of juvenile western salmon. And we did this through uh, looking at these two critical periods. Now we knew that we weren't going to be able to look at the near shore, which is that first 40 days, because of the gear and the type of vessels that we already had available to us. We knew that the fish are going to have to be further further offshore for us to be able to sample them. So our, the, we determined that the best time period for us to be out there would be uh, mid-August through about mid to late September, uh, based on earlier research that's been done at Bering Sea. And essentially what we were going to be doing is looking at the fitness of the fish prior to this their first winter at sea. So size and energetic status. Are they fit? Are they going to make it through winter? Can we connect, collect enough ecosystem information that might be able to tell us uh, how the climate is going to be impacting this business? So here's my example of we started the work in 1999. Uh, this is in the eastern Bering Sea. Uh, the Bering Sea has a very different productivity regime than many of the other places that you, that you guys are we are going to be looking at, especially the Salish Sea, uh, productivity is basically ice-driven. And this is a, a, a segment of a time series of spring temperature anomalies from the Bering Climate uh, website. And as you can see, in 1999, temperatures, spring temperatures, anomalously cold, it warmed up. We had a number of years where it was anomalously warm, and then it got cold again. And you might say, well, what does that mean? Well, because productivity is, is ice-driven in the Bering Sea, and this temperature is, is significant related to ice covers, uh, we had a hypothesis that was developed by George Hunt and recently updated with data from our survey uh, to reflect changes in the ecosystem that uh, looked at productivity based on ice extent during spring. Um, and what you see is that if there's an early ice retreat, in other words, if it's warmer in the, in the uh, winter and, and spring, you get this early ice retreat. I remember yesterday we talked about how do we get productivity in an ecosystem, why you need nutrients which are there after winter, but you also need stability of the water column and sunlight. Well, because uh, there's a lot of wind in the Bering Sea, most people know that, they've watched how they catch. It takes a while for it to uh, calm down, and when it finally does calm down, you get a stable water column, tidal plankton bloom, and then a cocoa pod, and everything else uh, takes off after that. 
the opposite occurs if we have a really cold time period. You get a lot of ice to extend into the southern Bering Sea. Um, when that begins to melt back in around April, uh, it provides a fresh water land, helps to stabilize the water column. Of course, you've got light, and then you get a bloom that occurs earlier. Uh, the previous hypothesis that was uh, developed by Hunt said most of this production fell to the bottom. So you have pelagic versus benthic uh, type productivity. But because of the survey the data that we've collected over the last, uh, well, during, especially during this time period, we noted that if there's sustainable warm warming on the eastern Bering Sea shelf, we were getting not only uh, a lot of copepods out there, but they were these more warm water copepods, which Bill was talking about. It had to have sustained warming for this to happen, but that had a dramatic impact on the ecosystem. And many of you probably know about the North Pacific Research Board funded a, a very large project to look at how climate well, connecting physics to fish, essentially, in, in the Bering Sea, looking for, uh, for pollock recruitment. And uh, some of the goals were to, well, the biggest question was, how will climate warming affect the Bering Sea ecosystem? They had three years they were going to do the, the, the uh, field work. They got this funded. It was about a $50 million project, the three years that they were going to, to actually look at how warming is affecting the Bering Sea or 2008, 9, and 10. Well, those are the three coldest years we've had. So, Again, that's developed, that, so their models are getting developed off a cold period, so what they're seeing may not be a, a real effect of warm period. So anyway, I caution there for time, you need a good time frame to be able to address what's happening, especially if you're trying to collect, connect climate to fish. All right, so that's some salmon data. So we've, we've been able to uh, Work with uh, geneticists to determine where these fish are coming from. This is juvenile Chinook distribution. You might see that some of the time periods, uh, this is supposed to be warm, this is supposed to be cold. Uh, summertime in this six and seven were actually a lot warmer than the spring. It really started getting cold in the summertime in 2009 through 11. And I think you can see there's some real changes in the distribution for juvenile Chinook. These are from the, U from the Yukon River. You can see them up here in the Bering Strait, and this is Norton Sound. Not a lot of fish down here. And then you move down into the southern Bering Sea. These are Tuskequim and Michigan River Chinook. When it got cold, we saw a real shift in the distribution. So, again, this is, if you were only out there during this period, this would be your picture of distribution for salmon. And if you're trying to do any kind of modeling, and suddenly this happens, your models are going to fail. We noticed that uh, the diets have been primarily fish, capelin, and sand lance, although pollock increased in the diet in the north. This is for the northern Bering Sea now. Uh, during the warm years, that's because there was a, a real big increase in pollock in the surface waters, and age zero pollock in, age zero pollock in the surface waters in those years. And when it got colder, capelin became a real important uh, diet component along with sand lance. Uh, we noted that our survey Wow, that five minutes went fast. <laughs> we noticed from our survey that the Cape one, uh, rather than the also increased. We're catching Cape one in our net along with, the, along with the Chinook. This is a real case for site selective mortality. This is in the case where actually the salmon is the predator. And we noticed that there was herring in the diet and also Cape one in the diet, but that the salmon, when we looked at the diets of the stomach contents of the salmon, they're actually feeding on the smaller. Um, these smaller animals within the within the size frequency that we caught in our net. Uh, another story for juvenile sockeye salmon from Bristol Bay. Again, genetic analyses have been done on these, and you can see that uh, once again, this is the warm distribution. They were very broadly distributed offshore. All these X's are places where we sampled and didn't catch any. And in the cold years, they're constricted more into uh, Bristol Bay. And the big trading did work back in the 1970s, the early 70s, when it was really cold. And this was the model that was produced for sockeye salmon migration out of Bristol Bay and into the North Pacific. But 
when we were out there in the warm years, there's a real different picture. And if you're going to be modeling anything, that's, again, it's a it's a different stra a different scenario based on the type of uh, ecosystem that we were seeing. And we also saw a real shift in the diets. Um, again, age of pollock were really important in the surface waters in those years. And salmon, especially uh, Bristol Bay sockeye salmon, were feeding quite heavily on them. And when it got colder, they, they switched to eposids, and the pollock actually dropped out of the surface waters in those colder years. So, all right, so maybe your objective is to improve forecast for salmon returns. I know Southeast Alaska had a big salmon return, not this last year, but the year before for pinks. Can we do that with some of the information we're getting from these surveys? Uh, Yes, and, and maybe. So if we, this is the uh, juvenile year and the relative abundance of Canadian origin juvenile Chinook from the Yukon River. Again, this is based on genetic analyses. If we compare that to the adult returns, we have five data points, and that's not a lot. Uh, there's a, a decent fit there. And what that is telling us with the five data points that we have is that a lot of the variability and mortality is occurring prior to our survey. So those, that first 40 days of sea. But it seems like with the survey we have, we might be able to inform management on, on uh, forecasts for, for Chinook to the Yukon three to five years later. Can we do this for Bristol Bay sockeye salmon? I want you to take a look at, and this is going to get the energy story, why, why energy is important, but you see these two huge um, years that we saw, 2005 and 2007. Um, does this help us uh, in, in forecasting for Bristol Bay? Well, we didn't see a very good fit there with all the data that we have. In fact, here's uh, five and seven right here. While the returns weren't bad, they certainly weren't what we would have expected based on our juvenile index. <clears throat> and I, this slide has a lot of information in it. I know it may not seem like it, but uh, there was a survey by the Russians in 2009 in the winter uh, that occurred south of the Aleutian chain. They caught a lot of uh, sockeye salmon and pink salmon, and we were able to get samples from them. And so if you're looking for this overwinter mortality signal, uh, we were looking at uh, the sockeye that they got, the genetic analysis on those, and 60% of those fish were from Bristol Bay. Uh, most of them were age one, so these are fish that actually survived winter that came from Bristol Bay the previous fall. So if you think that the fish that we got from that winter survey, if this is actually the baseline energy for a surviving sockeye salmon that made it through winter, then can, how can we compare our juveniles with that baseline? And you can see here in five and seven, these are pretty much dead fish swimming. Yep, they uh, they weren't very fit prior to winter. And if we just want to take energy as a, a, and relate that to uh, an index of survival, we can see a pretty good fit, at least for the five data points we have for for juvenile sockeye salmon from Bristol Bay. And this is for age zero pollock. Um, this is recruitment to age one. This is the warm years when a lot of that uh, energy out there was in small small little plankton that these fish are feeding on. They didn't have good survival, but there's a really good fit with just total energy and recruitment to age one. Wow, I have less than a minute, and I wanted to really highlight this because this is Joe Orsi's work, and this is a pink salmon index that he's gathered. He looks at pink, uh, pink uh, Customer effort from July, and he's able to forecast returns to pink salmon the following year based on this survey. And this is a seasonal transect in southeast Alaska that I think would be useful if this is the type of information you're looking for. He always likes to point out that there was this 2005 ocean year where it didn't work, and that's because when he was out, we actually had a survey offshore that year. It was warm, and there were a lot of species in the, along southeast Alaska that, that don't normally exist, like humble squid sardines, blue sharks, uh, you tumbled squid, and Joe had two, a lot, two of these things that alive. He put in a tank, he left, he came back, there was one left. They really are voracious feeders, and they think they probably were just heavily hitting the pink stem when they left southeast. This is for Chinook, and it looks promising. Um, again, this is for Taku River. Not as good a fit, but still good for all the data points he has. And then, uh, 
again, I explain that the, when you see good fit like that, the variability in survival is likely happening prior to our surveys, so first 40 days. Another thing that I want you to have a take-home message on is that's going to be an important time period if you're looking for uh, how to explain variability in survival. And we tried to do this in the Gulf of Alaska with transect data, and I just, there we go. It didn't work for us with transects, but it does work for us with uh, grids. Um, this is the information I wanted to show you. This is the Sitka Eddy, and these are sockeye salmon that were captured around that eddy. There's a lot of information in there about the change in some of the diet structure for these fish. And I also want you to note that about 40 to 50 percent of those fish were from the Fraser River. So, again, your fish are leaving the Salish Sea, <laughs> and they're coming up into the Gulf of Alaska. And we hope to be around long enough to go from point A to point B. <laughs> Of the uh, type of cocoa plus that they're making 
it's like all that. It, 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 it can be a carrying capacity effect. I mean, I didn't say carrying capacity. I used to work in the ocean carrying capacity program. But uh, it, obviously, carrying capacity is, is, is a variable anyway. But uh, it could be. I mean, they, in 2005, they were, they were feeding on these pollock, which were low in energy anyway. And, and that doesn't mean that they weren't growing. They were growing quite well. But I, they just weren't laying in the list of them on prior. And why they weren't doing that, it was pretty warm out there. So, lots of food. Okay, and that's our friend and Dr. Lloyd. Okay, this is a question for the last three speakers also. For Ian Perry, um, there were very large programs with very different approaches to water and transport of the program. And I wonder if any of you feel like it was just kind of on two things. What do you mean when you say modeling ideally? And what uh, ideally, how ideally would that be important into your program if you have to do it over again? I made that example of the North Pacific Research Board that had uh, three years of uh, sampling. That was to develop a model, and that model is physics to fish. So that's a climate model, which is an IPCC uh, climate change. I don't know remember which scenarios we're using it, we're using four of those. That then feeds a nutrient phytoplankton zooplankton model. That's being, uh, I've seen the results from that model, and it's, and it's a 3D model in the water column, and it looks really good. It's been actually captured. I'm surprised, even with the data they have, they were able to capture that shift in the, the type of little plankton out there. And in the warmer years, then when it went back to cold, it, 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 I've seen the results of the model. That NPV model looks good. Then it's going into a bioenergetics model, which is called SEAT, which takes a supercomputer to run. And that model is actually looking at the change, not only in recruitment for the target species for the pollen, but also in the shift in, the, in what they feel will be the distribution and how that might impact commercial fishery if it continues to warm up. So, what I'm looking at is we're talking about salmon, as we have the NPV. We're going to do Chinook, of course, we have to try to connect that to the uh, forage fish that are important in the diet, so I think we can do that. And then looking at bioenergetics to get growth and energy prior to the first winter. Okay. So? Uh, Maybe hey, I should talk to you offline, Crocker. We're doing all kinds of different things. And there are statistical models that this model has been captured to have a set very good. So you have, uh, in terms of the case, this tool model to help us decide where this happens and so on, which is kind of interesting. We have, you know, Mondi Lorenzo's global model, driving a regional model to look at circulation and changes in cocoa pods, that kind of model. Um, and then we have some E to E models. Is it the E to E? What are they called? Is it E to E? Oh, it's E to E. E to E models. It's being done by Jim Rodica and the Tom Emery. So we have all kinds of models that we do. So it's all used to that. In our program, we took quite a, quite a broad view of what models are. We have the uh, NPZD model that we're supposed to feed up into the ecopass with the ecosystem model. We haven't quite got that connection yet. Um, I mentioned that we had two different kinds of hypertrophic level models. So we had what's called an osmos model as well as the ecopass with ecosystem. And I really recommend that approach as I spoke yesterday. But in addition, we had um, habitat suitability models. We had the bubble ballistic network model. And we had straightforward statistical models. So, Modeling, in, in my view, is a very broad concept um, that, that we use a number of tools to help us understand what they might be able to tell us about. And I would just say, in Peter's town, we, do, we are doing it again. So, I mean, stuff we have to do, we're doing it again. And the models are everywhere. It's so many purposes. Thanks. Right. Yeah, I have a question for Bill. Um, so the prey, the prey items that we have seen for fairly sea uh, juvenile salmon and for Alaska juvenile salmon are either fish or uh, larger invertebrates. And 
I heard you saying that a lot of conversation, a lot of um, focus on cultural fiber. Is there really a difference in the diet of um, juvenile salmon that you're catching off of Washington, uh, Oregon, and Jersey on the coast? Um, that was more dominated by cultural fiber. And the second question is, you said that you need special gear to measure the prey field, and not only special gear, but it's a separate boat. And I'm just sort of, from a technical perspective, what is that? What is that gear? Well, the first question is if they're using the same thing as everybody else is using. Mean, two thousand and small fish, similar to pike, tail pike, things like this. But they're not even talking about them. The bubble pot index is mostly to just write down to food chain and stuff. That's the best that's fine. So the food chain is a scatty one or whatever. And it really matches up well with that survival situation. I think she thinks that it's the lipid thing in cocoa pies, it's the lipid thing in the small fish that the same thing Okay. Well, in terms of what we checked with the troll, I mean, we, uh, there's a cloud in of a certain size. And uh, but the troll is an interesting troll. It's a rope troll. It's not like a, you know, the outer of Nash is like a five foot high. It's a wing. So you're actually hurting the salmon into the troll itself. And you don't know whether you're hurting in a little fish. Also, so you don't really know what's, you know, actually what's the bunch of this fish are like in a troll like that. You have to use a kind of frog with all the same mesh, but you can tell as fast as you can. I think it's a little bit. It might be a bit of a so the small fish bringing in the back end of our salmon so I don't know if that's going to work. It's kind of wrong. Yeah, but uh, what do you think, Mark? I mean, do you think you can get away with a, a smaller cod or a smaller mesh cod in on your salmon frog to look at the prey? No. You know, we debated this a lot, huh? No, I think you need to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, I, I can't remember if our, the mesh size of your trawl and our trawl is about the same, but it's an audience for the mesh Yeah, six millimeters. Mm -hmm. we, we can catch you found this in small needlefish, but I only use this in a quantitative way. I think that in order to get the, the prey field, that the abundance of the prey that we're in, that's the kind of like chewing on, you need to use a different type of gear, which is either the puppet troll or the Nisa net. And, uh, but you don't need an opening and closing net. I mean, you said something about depth distribution of prey, so I was on the website that went to like a large amount of No, you need, you need to think about, well, I'll be using some herring salt for a couple of years. I don't know if I got herring salt. I don't remember the amount of herring salt. Was it 10 meters or was it 10 feet? So it's a small fish that's sort of hard to catch. You can catch amplifiers in a bottle net and curl at night. It's just these small fish that are the more tricky ones. There's no depth distribution you have to worry about. Oh, we think there might be things that are just important. We're not really sure. Yeah. But it has to be, I think, a different form. I really do, and that's extra effort. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, kind of comment on the two box that um, and that's a that how important it is to know where your salmon are from, um, what stock you're doing with them, and then also to determine what the market short patterns are. So, like off the coast of Washington and Oregon, we don't get any steelhead except a little bit of May in May when they're fresh entering the ocean, and they do tend to trade out. Um, we see a lot of them in the estuary, we don't have them in the ocean. They're working on through there, and, and just that kind of information. There, there are a lot of art forms looking at the migratory pattern. It's really critical to know where your fish are. If you're going to look at what the ecosystem is, and until you figure that out, you're just shooting in the dark. Okay, um, yeah, this is the, the modeling question now the uh, system of the field sampling. There's a, I guess um, one thing that I, I would emphasize with the state we're at right now is that there's general agreement right now that coho and Shemaxana populations in the Sailor Sea area are severely depressed. One of the consequences of that is you enter into a situation which Andrew alluded to, which is this, this, this trap for, for some of these depressed populations. So what model can help you resolve is situations where a very common predator species, like, like a, not that I believe that they're necessarily a relationship, but as an example, a, uh, some of the seals uh, and some of these other 
large biomass fish predators out there, or if you want to play statistics, you may never see salmon show up in those diet compositions when you're doing MSC. So one of the important things of the model is to help you try to resolve through uh, that sort of thing that might be missing to see if that is something you should be looking for or to suggest novel ways that feedback may exist that, that you can work through. Um, so that's why I would advocate that the models are useful at the front end uh, to help generate that sort of field research program because sometimes when you're not looking for it, it could be easy to miss. But I, I still think that the majority of the work in the end has to be that field work because if you're not ground for some of the models that they use.